The CAS panel on Friday last week issued a summons that all parties needed to attend the hearing on Saturday. So the JAAA showed up at that under, under threat of basically contempt. That's what it took for them to show up. Uh, and I, I think, as, as both of you know, they have no problem showing up when it's time to fight the JOA. They, they know how to throw media conferences and so on then. But that is quite literally what it took for the JAAA to show up. A summons from a CAS panel, basically under, under, under penalty of contempt, that you have to show up on Saturday. And, and so, unfortunately, as you say, the CAS panel ruled that, look, they don't have jurisdiction. And the, the, the route we took was a, quite, it was a quite intentional route. So the CAS has a few divisions, but the main ones for us is there's something called the CAS ad hoc division. And the ad hoc division has jurisdiction over any Olympic dispute that arises 10 days before the opening ceremony. So any dispute that arose basically from Tuesday last week, this body would have jurisdiction. And the beauty of the ad hoc division is that the proceedings are free. That is one of the main advantages of it. And the proceedings are fast. So once the hearing is done, the panel issues a decision within 24 hours. So like incredibly, incredibly fast. Uh, but then outside of that, there's regular, regular CAS, as I'll call it. And to get to regular CAS, if it's a, if it's a hearing of, say, three arbitrators, you're basically paying for the arbitrator's time, which is something like 40 to 50,000 US. So, you know, unless people have 40 to 50,000 US lying around, it, it's really not a viable route for athletes from, quite frankly, most countries. Mm -hmm. and, and what the CAS will tell you is, well, no, we have, we have legal aid, and you can apply for legal aid and so on, which is, which is all true, but you still have to apply for legal aid, and there's no guarantee that you'll get it. Uh, yep. There's even the possibility of costs being awarded against you, right? In in, in regular cas, so regular cas is is still a route available on on paper. Whether it's a practical route is a different story. Yeah, I I gathered from the ruling from cas as well, Emir, that given the the stipulation of the maximum thirty two um, in the competition. Um, listing uh, for her to be added would make 33 and they 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 they, they really can't do that I don't think that is, that is like you know someone being um, inadvertently left off a football team and you're asking them to to, to put them in as a 12th player <laughs> instead of the 11 so yeah. I, I, I the, to me the horse had gone through the gate already and uh, the J3As, as you said, they haven't really said anything to you and didn't contribute much to the CAS hearing, but they have issued two press releases um, expressing their, their sadness at what happened and still hoping that there's a possibility that someone could drop out and, and um, Nayuka could still get in at the 11th hour. But let's say that doesn't happen. What would be her attorney's next move? Well, well, to address that, I mean, what could happen? Because we had, we had, we did have to turn our mind to how do we deal with that situation, right? I mean, fundamentally, you're either adding an athlete or displacing an athlete, right? And so, for the ad hoc proceedings, the Ukrainian athlete and the Ukrainian Olympic uh, Federation were both notified as well as being potentially affected. Because one route, one argument is to say that the Ukrainian athlete should not have been on the list because she didn't, she didn't earn that spot, right? But for the JAAA's negligence, she would never be there. So one argument is to put Nayoko Klunas in her spot. And then another option is, as you say, to add uh, another athlete. And the IOC does have a, a late replacement policy. And, and the last line, last sentence of that, that policy 
says that they can make changes to that policy in exceptional circumstances. Mm. So, uh, to a willing to a willing panel, there there is an an out because the IOC's own policies say in exceptional circumstances they can change yes. their own policies. And so, if a CAS panel were to order the change, it's, I guess it, it's still a change, but there there is. There is a remedy, and I, I, I go back to this because during the course of the proceedings, we, the panel ordered uh, emails between the JAAA and the World Athletics. So we, we had never seen those until last Friday, and so World Athletics handed over some emails. And look, at basic, it seems that a dispute could be raised by the JAAA itself before regular cast. And uh, Ms. Clunas could be named as a co co claimant, co applicant, whatever. Uh, but that route is still available. So even though it may not be practically available to Ms. Clunas, there, there's no reason that the JAAA couldn't explore that route and bring Ms. Clunas uh, along for the proceedings. Of course, nothing is guaranteed because there is, as you, as you hinted, that sort of obstacle of, like, what do we do in terms of fashioning a remedy? Do we remove an athlete? Do we add someone in even though the, the quota is full? So there is, there is still the merits problem to overcome, but there's still a viable remedy this week. So I'm glad the JAAA is, as they say, saddened and using every effort. I trust that the every effort also includes seeking legal advice as to whether they can themselves raise a, a dispute with regular CAS. Because everybody who was at the ad hoc hearing agreed that if needed, they would, they would agree to expedite proceedings before uh, regular CAS uh, if needed. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I put that out there because there's still, in, in theory, a remedy available. Uh, as I say, it might help the JAAA with their sadness if perhaps they did that. Mm -hmm. um, so I just heard you um, reference the J3A seeking legal advice. I'm, I'm getting the feeling from your posture that, that they'll need it. Themselves. Well, yeah, yeah. And, and, and at the hearing, they were represented by uh, Mike Morgan of Morgan Sports Law. And Mike Morgan, uh, his reputation precedes him. So they were, they were well, well represented at, at the ad hoc uh, division. So uh, I assume that, that they, could, they could equally uh, get advice as to whether they could go to the regular PAS. And outside of that process, uh, I do think there is still the bigger issue of what happens outside of the Olympics with respect to the JAAA's accountability and liability for their negligence. Yeah. Right? And Amir, you know, we sit here today just a couple days before the opening ceremony for Paris 2024. And, you know, I have to ask you, how is Miss Clunas doing? And, you know, what has she been saying to you? Because it's, it's the time that every athlete really looks forward to. It's what they've worked on for quite some time, look forward to. And it must be really heartbreaking for her to just be right now sitting, not sure what to do next when she should actually be training. Right. No, exactly. And, and when we've spoken to her, she's, she's been in tears. I mean, she's, I think she's rightfully so, right? She's... This is this is devastating, and look. I, I... Arguing with the JOA, and by the way, the JOA uh, has been uh, supportive of the process and so on. And I, I don't lay any blame at them. It, it's really the JAAA that that conveniently knows when to come out of hiding, and do press and give press releases. But apparently, when it comes to being held accountable, there, there's a complete absence of that. And, and look, it's deplorable what's happened to her. Yeah. It's absolutely deplorable. And, and she, she, as you say, she's, 
she's sitting there uh, with these sort of unanswered WhatsApp messages from various officials saying, we're doing our best, we, you know, we're working hard behind the scenes for you and so on. I, I, quite frankly, I, I told her, look, we are going to press ahead and file this CAS appeal because I don't believe a word of what every, everyone is telling you because people, I quite frankly think people are just trying to wind down the clock until it's, it is just too late. Then. There is some, at some point, it just becomes too late. And I think that's what the JEEE was hoping for, just to wind down the clock. And I said, we're not going to have that. We're going to file. We filed 11 p.m. last uh, Tuesday. Uh, so technically, it was registered 8.30 a.m. Paris time on Wednesday. But that's what happened between Wednesday and Saturday. It was a very in intensive process and so on. But outside of that, had that not happened, would anyone be having this conversation? I, I don't think so. I think the JAAA was hoping people would just move on to other stories and people would just completely forget that they somehow blamed a hurricane for leaving off one athlete's name. It's either, it's either they leave out all the names or none. Yeah. Hurricane Barrel is not a selective hurricane as far as I know. So whatever excuse that is about the hurricane and electricity and the internet, either that excuse applies for every athlete they entered or did not enter, or it, it, it's literally just an excuse. Yeah, how They're you... hiding behind Hurricane Barrel when that excuse, and probably if you're World Athletics or the IOC reading these emails, the, the, these emails have no semblance of, of, of reality to them. So, so how could they take them seriously? Yeah, and you know, Emir, there's the question looming around that maybe they should not have said that. Uh, they should not have said that reasoning, that excuse for her being, um, you know, left out because as a matter of fact, it, it begs to so many different questions because we, we, we're here in Jamaica, we know um, the different people that were affected because of this hurricane barrel, but to say that, you know, a lot, um, one, one athlete was affected based on this hurricane, to me, it just comes across a bit strange. Well, yeah, and, and I think what they were hoping for is that you'd have people, uh, World Athletics is based in uh, Monaco, and IOC is based in uh, Lausanne, Switzerland. So I think they were hoping that you'd have people in, in these jurisdictions who have no idea about a hurricane, right? It's like if I say that I was affected by a snowstorm, right? Like if you don't know what a snowstorm is, you'd be like, oh, maybe, maybe Crown was affected by a snowstorm. Uh, but if you if you if you're not if you don't know what a snowstorm is, you know that maybe maybe some parts aren't as affected as heavily as they are, just like a hurricane. So I think they just use that excuse, hoping it would it would just sort of just just so people would be like, oh, a hurricane, and you conjure up these uh, mm. these images of you know palm trees blowing and debris and so on, and nobody would actually drill down into it. But the excuse holds absolutely no water. It, I mean, the JAAA should be ashamed to raise that excuse. And in fact, it is embarrassing to the people who have actually been affected by Hurricane Barrel. Yeah, and the because fact is... Because you have the JAAA emailing World Athletics, mm. claiming we have email problems at the same time that they're emailing World Athletics. Mm. It can't be both, again. And again, it, it's the absolute lack of of accountability that, that that's shocking in this entire process. Yeah. And as I say, they have one chance to step up, to possibly file their own proceedings. And I, I wait to be seen. As I say, their own press release says they're making every effort. So, Yeah, that, that that's unforgivable, Emir. I, I must agree with you there, because not, not everywhere in Jamaica was out of electricity. And uh, there are generators all over the place, so there are ways to ensure that if you have something important enough to do, you can, you ca you could have gotten it done. That that's the reality of the situation. So um, when I heard that excuse, that was that was that was shocking to me. I found it pretty appalling for a governing body that runs uh, or presides over uh, a, a group of athletes that are among the are among the best in the world. But Emir, we'll continue to um, keep in touch with you on this on this topic because. I, I know that it isn't going to end here, and uh, we would like you to relate to Naoko Clunis for us our, our sympathy and our m massive disappointment about what has happened to her. She is the 
most outstanding hammer thrower from CARICOM all time. Her recent uh, elevation taking her past the Jamaican Dana Levy and um, Candy Scott from your Trinidad and Tobago as the best hammer thrower in the history of a CARICOM competition. So she has worked hard to get where she is and it is completely unforgivable that she is going through what she is going through here at the moment. But thanks, uh, Attorney Emir Crown, for talking to us. And um, we will keep in touch with you because I know that this story isn't going to end here. Thanks a lot. We'll talk again soon. Thank you. Yeah, we'll go to break now. We'll be back with more on the Sportsmat Zone after this.